Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. My name is Alita Sprague, and I am a policy analyst with the Asset Building Program at the New America Foundation. The Asset Building Program works on a wide range of policy proposals to enable low and moderate income Americans to build wealth and move up the economic ladder. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to an event that will focus directly on some of the key barriers to those objectives. Chasing the American Dream, Who's Left Behind, and How Do They Get Ahead? We borrowed the title of today's event from an important new book that draws on an extensive series of interviews to explore how the concept of the American Dream has evolved and how it is perceived and defined by Americans of varying backgrounds in an era of growing wealth and income inequality. We're very lucky to have two of the authors present, and we will be kicking off with a discussion of their findings and some of the policy implications of their work. Uh, Chasing the American Dream is available for sale outside, and I'd urge you all to pick up a copy if you haven't already. One of the key insights of the book is that while the American Dream is premised on the idea of individual effort and determination, we're all operating within an inequitable landscape of, op of opportunity, as the authors term it, which is structured by labor market conditions, geography, gender, class, and race. And that landscape has changed significantly over the past several decades. It is also, of course, shaped by policy choices, including the structure of our tax code and public assistance systems. In the second half of the program, we want to build on this theme and think more critically about the role of policy in determining who has access to the type of economic opportunity the American dream represents. In, particularly, in particular, we'll be examining how even today, Public policy explicitly denies certain groups opportunities to move up the economic ladder. We'll assess whether the American dream is a one-shot deal or whether we enable second chances, and if so, for whom. And finally, we'll explore how big data and technology play a role in both facilitating and constricting opportunity. This topic intersects and interacts with so many different issue areas. On our second panel, we'll have speakers from a leading criminal justice organization, a prominent technology research institute, and an influential public policy school. Just in the past few weeks, as we've been planning this event, I've come across a range of pieces in the media that relate to this topic, and I want to highlight just a couple before we get started, because I think they showcase how pervasive these issues are within a wide range of policy debates and discussions. First, a new report came out just last week from the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, enumerating over 45,000 codified barriers to employment, housing, public assistance, and basic political rights for individuals returning to their communities from prison. In the aggregate, these collateral consequences result in a massive population, or disproportionately men of color, cut off from the American dream even after they have ostensibly paid their debt to society. In The Atlantic, ta Coates had a remarkable piece about how an extensive history of intentionally discriminatory policy created an American dream long reserved exclusively for white Americans, particularly as it relates to home ownership. And lastly, a few weeks ago, a European court ruled that a plaintiff had a right to be forgotten and have information about himself removed from search engines. The case itself underscores how past mistakes can define our futures as never before. So while these three pieces may at first glance seem somewhat disconnected, I think they each speak to factors that shape our modern day conceptions of and interactions with the American dream. We're living in an era of unprecedented wealth inequality, where we both failed to fully reckon with our collective past, while at the same time allowing our individual histories to drastically limit our future potential. So I think we have a lot to talk about and we're in for a really interesting discussion. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Black, who will be moderating our first panel. Rachel is a senior policy analyst with the Asset Building Program, where she focuses on reform of asset limits and public assistance programs, federal spending in support of asset building objectives, and initiatives to increase savings at tax time. Joining her on stage are two of the authors of Chasing the American Dream, Mark Rank and Thomas Herschel. Their full bios are available in the program materials, but just to provide a brief introduction, Mark Rank is the Herbert S. Hadley Professor of Social Welfare at Washington University in St. Louis, and is widely recognized as one of the country's foremost experts on poverty, inequality, and social, or social justice. 
Thomas Herschel is a professor of development sociology at Cornell University, where he is also the director of the Population and Development Program and the coordinator of the work team on poverty and economic hardship. We will reserve plenty of time for questions at the end, and we also invite our online audience to submit questions via Twitter using the handle at AssetsNAF or the hashtag ShapingOurFortunes. Rachel. Great, Alita. Thanks so much for the introduction. And Mark and Tom, thank you both so much for being here to talk about your book. Um, I think it's something that's really, um, it's very contemporary. The issue resonates. but. In a way, the idea of the American dream has been with us since our founding. And I think what's so important about your book is it contextualizes this idea really within modern experiences and modern circumstances. Um, I think one of the primary ways in the book that you get at understanding what the American dream is and the opportunities that are out there are through um, an extensive amount of interviews with, with people. Um, so just sort of a, in that spirit, I'd really like to get started by turning to our audience and seeing um, what you think the American dream is. Um, if you've eaten anything outside, you've already obligated yourself to participate in this exercise, <laughs> you may be called on. <laughs> so if we could just get you know, three or four hands, I'd really love to hear. Right? Oh, here we go. And there's a microphone going around, so please wait for it to get to you. Hello. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Sahan. I'm here for the summer interning in Washington, D.C. I'm, uh, um, I'm from the University of Iowa. So uh, for me, the American dream is for me is uh, achieving the best you can. And for me personally, I'm an immigrant. I was born and raised in Sri Lanka and I moved to the United States when I was 16 years old. So for me, it's just seeing the endless possibilities and seeing um, what is because what you can achieve is endless in this country. And for, for me, the American dream personally is doing well, the best you can to be the best in your field, whether it be engineering or finance or politics, um, or whatever field you pick. So for me, it's being the best in your field. Great, thank you. I'm uh, Ibrahim Mukman. I'm a, uh, a workforce development consultant. And what's really important to me is for people to be able to get a, a, a decent job making an income that can help support them and their families and also making sure that people who are ex-offenders or returning citizens have the opportunity to pursue their, their craft and, and not be turned down because of previous mistakes they made. Mm. Great, thank you. Let's take maybe two more. I'm Boris Cherner with CBA Credit Builders uh, Alliance. Uh, to me, the American dream is not just economic. It's also a place uh, or an opportunity to not encounter these barriers that we're going to be talking about, uh, essentially pursuit of liberty, happiness, and property, property being last in my priorities. Great. And one more. Hi, my name is Hassan Durant. I uh, work as a staff writer for Science Magazine. Uh, to me, the American dream is to be able to live a comfortable life while also not stepping on the toes of others in order to achieve that comfortable life. That's great. Thank you all for, for sharing those ideas. So, Mark and Tom, I think we've heard um, the ability to get a good job and provide for your family, um, the ability to sort of engage in uh, the activities that it takes to advance without encountering barriers to doing so. Um, how, do, how do these ideas sort of square with what you've heard in your research? Well, I think this reflects really well in terms of what we found. So we talked to um, 75 people from all walks of life and asked them questions about various questions, but questions about what the American dream meant to them. And based on that information and based on survey information, we kind of distilled the American dream into three big components. Uh, the first one is the idea, which was, which was first raised in the, from the audience, the idea that the American dream is really about being able to pursue your passion, pursue your interests, so that you can really develop your full biography and really bring out your full potential. That's one thing that people said the American dream is about, that I can follow my path and, and, and do that. A second component, which was also mentioned by the audience, was the idea that 
if you work hard, you should have economic security. You should be able to lead a comfortable life. Um, not that you're going to be rich or anything like that, but that by working hard and playing by the rules, you should have economic security. And that's, that was a second big component of what people said was the American dream. And then the third one, which was also hinted on in, in, in the audience response, was um, the idea that the American dream is about hope, about optimism, about making progress in your life, about making progr seeing progress in your children's lives so that each generation is seen as doing better than the previous generation. So those were three big components that we found uh, when people were asked about what is the American dream. That's great. Yeah, I think, I think that's really important that we, we worked really hard to kind of say what is to define the thing according to how people live their lives and not just uh, you know, sort of be abstract about it. Because we, what we found is that people are actually very motivated to pursue the American dream. This is a really powerful thing. And in our data, what we also see is we also had uh, life course data looking at what happened to people between the ages of 25 and 60. And what we find is a lot of fluidity, both at the top and at the bottom. A lot of people have experiences of poverty and experiences of, of high income and wealth. And there's a lot, of, a lot of fluidity. And we think that that's one of the real tensions in our culture is that people feel insecure because of this, this churning and fluidity in our society. And the fact that the top and the bottom are becoming farther and farther apart. So uh, we think that's one of the reasons why, for example, in politics you have like a Tea Party movement or something where people are saying, I, I don't want to just vote for this party or that party. I really want to change the rules to try to sort of shore up my situation. Great. I'd, I'd love to follow up on, uh, on the dynamics. You mentioned that people are broadly feeling insecure about, about their future. And you have a pair of uh, really perplexing statistics, uh, one that uh, most of us at some point during our working years will be economically insecure, and another that most of us will at some point um, be in the top 20% of income earners. Um, those seem almost contradictory, and they certain, certainly suggest a lot of um, volatility um, as yes. well as mobility. Yes. Can you talk us through that? Well, a lot of people are, you know, we've done a lot of work on the, on the lower end of the income distribution and have found this idea that most people during their lives will experience a spell of poverty, near poverty. Um, in fact, we find that if you define economic insecurity as poverty, the use of a welfare program, or being unemployed, 79% of Americans between 25 and 60 will experience at least one year of that kind of economic insecurity. So it's, it's very, very high. And one of the reasons is we're looking over such a long period of time. So if you think about your own lives and you think about what happens between, say, 25 and 60, that's 36 some odd years of information. And things happen to people that they didn't anticipate, both good things and bad things. So we focused a lot on the, on the bottom end, but we also find this, this, uh, this effect on the top end. And Tom, maybe you could talk about the, the, what we found in terms of the top end of the income distribution. Yeah, we were, we were very surprised. Uh, one of the things is that um, if you look over time, our data starts in 1968 and goes till the year 2011. And you see that the top end is moving up as, you know, because people are getting higher and higher income. Despite that, the fact that it's moving up, we find that if you observe people between the ages of 25 and 60, now this is a lot, 36 years, Mark just mentioned that, you find that actually 12% of the population get this top 1% income, which is a, a you know, pretty high six-figure income. But they don't necessarily stay there very long, and it's only a small fraction of the, of the population that stays there for 10 years or more. So actually, even in the top 1%, you have a, a small part of it that's stable and a lot of people moving in and out. So again, this is speaking to the kind of the fluidity of our, uh, of our economy, I think. Well, and you know, we've, we've talked about this, that there's an image out there, speaking about the top end, there's an image of the 1% and the 99% that it's a very um, uh, static kind of image, that the 1% is the 1% is the 1%. But actually, there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of fluidity that's moving in and out, especially at the top, you know, 20, 10, 5, and then the 1% level. So there is a lot of volatility. And that, and that, um, that uh, sort of exemplifies some of the economic concerns that people have. There was a, there's a story we tell in the book about a factory worker who uh, was working at a Chrysler plant, and he was making 
about eighty ninety eighty thousand dollars a year he had a really good year one year where he made about a hundred thirty six thousand so he was in the top twenty percent and then a couple years later the plant shut down and he was now making about twenty five thousand as an independent roofer so he had experienced within four or five years this kind of fluctuations of, of, of income uh, throughout you know, the, the last few years. Yeah, and I think that illustrates one of, the, one of the factors that you mentioned in the book that helps um, determine what trajectory somebody will be on. I mean, you call them twists of fate. You have a chapter devoted to twists of fate. Uh, just sort of the random incidents that happen in people's lives, um, one of them being uh, becoming unemployed unexpectedly yes. and people, uh, people's ability to be resilient in those instances and continue forward or be scarred by those experiences varies widely. Can yes. you talk us a, a little yes. bit through that? So we have, uh, there's a chapter that's, that's called Twists of Fate and it's something that social scientists usually don't deal with. These kinds of things that happen in your life that you didn't anticipate that were fairly random, uh, a missed telephone call, a, a chance conversation, that actually had a profound influence. And so we have a chapter where we talk about three particularly profound twists of fate. And one example is somebody who just walks into the office one day and finds out he's being laid off. And it had nothing to do with anything he had done. It had to do with somebody else we had a conversation about reorganizing the department and that developed and, 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 and resulted in him being laid off. And the issue is those twists of fate are really profound in terms of impacting people's life course, but they're also important in terms of how individuals react to those twists of fate and, 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 and how they respond to that. And so again, we play that out with three different individuals who have pretty profound twists of fate and how they react to, to, to those situations. And what are the, some of the tools that people draw on uh, to be able to um, create a buffer? You talk um, specifically about savings, for instance, and um, certainly through our, our own work, we know that access to that particular tool that's both a buffer during times of financial disruption and uh, also necessary to move uh, up the up economic ladder is becoming much, much more concentrated and uh, less accessible to the people who are typically in situations where they're encountering, encountering these type of volatile situations. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, savings are certainly an important kind of economic buffer. I also think that um, we look at people's ability to intellectually understand what happened to them and then to respond positively. Another person that we feature in our chapter in Twists of Fate is someone who was actually grew up in Weimar, Germany, and was, as a young child, was involved in the Holocaust. And she somehow made it out on, a, on something called a kinder train. And then her whole life became dedicated to social justice causes. So it's really interesting that she saw something happen as a child, and then she responded to that intellectually and sort of dedicated her life to try to right social wrongs. So I think it's also, you know, there's an economic aspect, but there's also kind of, a, of an intellectual mental aspect that I think is really important, that people can see something wrong and then think of a way, well, let's try to make the world a better place because what I went through is shouldn't happen to other people. Well, and another example in that chapter is we, we have a, a case of an individual who as a child had, had a, 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 an accident where he was burned on over 95% of his body. And, you know, it was extremely traumatic. Uh, he barely survived. But he wound up being uh, an inspirational speaker and, and, and talked about you know, motivation and, uh, and dealing with adversity and that this, this had really, you know, later in his life, had a strong intellectual impact on where he went with his life. So in addition to Twist of Fate, which really sort of captures the idea of randomness, um, I think one of the takeaway points, as Alita alluded to, is that there really are these very powerful um, structural uh, constraints. And in some ways, um, where you end up is almost determined um, at birth. And you, you categorize these as um, 
or this theme is cumulative inequality. And in fact, you have this great visual. Um, it's the, the funnel model of achieving the American dream. And it looks very much the way that it sounds. It's very broad at the top, sort of encompassing everybody. And you identify sort of specific factors that um, make someone much more likely or less likely to end up in the American dream bucket at the bottom. Right, right. So we could think about, we, we focus, strongly on the factors of class and race. And you might think of them as strong currents that tend to push people in specific directions. That doesn't mean that everybody is pushed in that direction. There is individual agency and people do make decisions and so on. But those decisions should be understood within the context of, for example, class and race as having uh, uh, a, significant, a significant parameter in terms of the types of decisions that people can make. And so the funnel model starts out with people, um, you know, sort of aligned in different directions depending on their class, race, and ability. And then uh, that then leads to uh, a, a high quality or a lower quality education, which then leads to a higher or lower quality job. And so you can think about this over the life course, how this plays out, this notion of cumulative advantage or cumulative disadvantage. Yeah, I think it's a really good metaphor. Um, it's, it's kind of a metaphor about fluid dynamics. And if you think about race and class in American history, you know, 50, well, well I guess at the turn of, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, there was this sort of Jim Crow, this very hard barrier, the racial barrier, right? There was color, co you know, African Americans were prevented from going certain places, riding on certain trains, sitting in the back of the bus and so forth. And now you have a more dynamic kind of race and class system. And so you have fluid dynamics and people are tossed around. And so you have these funnels that people go through, educational funnels, family funnels, how much wealth your parents have. But the forces are very dynamic and people get tossed around and, and individuals end up in places they, that may be unexpected based on the categories that we have because the fluid dynamics are, are kind of pushing individuals around. And the question is thinking about what's the interaction between individual agency and individual actions and decisions versus these larger structural forces. And so we try to finesse that and say again that they're both important, but really the overall context that's really critical in terms of thinking about these things is the overall impact that in particular class and race have on people's life course trajectories. Yeah, I want to dig a little bit into a specific example from the book that I feel like uh, reflects what the experience of encountering, encountering this, um, these sort of conflicting um, channels is like between uh, sort of your understanding of how the system is supposed to work and your role in it. Um, this is um, from Gloria Ramirez, and she was um, a participant in one of your focus groups, and she said, uh, I actually feel like there's a triangle. There's a few wealthy people at the top that depend on a huge base to support the few wealthy people at the top, and it's been built that way. But the only way that workers are going to keep on working that way is if they think that they can get the American dream. If they keep working hard enough, paying their taxes, and doing all this stuff, it's like the bait. The carrot in front of the steps that are grinding on, doing all of the footwork and the grunt work so that those people at the top make it big. And um, I, I think that's a really powerful yeah. statement. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if you got that sense from other people that you were talking to that sort of in spite of their best efforts, uh, in spite of what they believe to be um, holding up their end of this bargain of the American dream, th they weren't making it. Well, th the interesting thing about that is um, the American dream is really a double-edged sword. Because on one hand, I mentioned at the beginning that hope, faith, thinking about progress is a key part of the American dream. And yet, for a number of people, they may th that may realistically not be there. But it's sort of like what Marx talked about when he talked about religion being the opiate of the, of the masses. The American dream, in a way, is the opiate of the American people. Because if you believe that eventually things will work out, you will struggle and you will persevere, uh, even though it, it may not happen. And so it's a, it's a very double-edged sword. But for most of the people we talk to, you know, when you think about your life, hope is really the last thing to go. It's the last thing to really to, to vanish. And so even though we talked with a lot of people who were struggling, some folks who were homeless, 
Um, but even in that case, I can think of sev several uh, guys that we talked to that were homeless that had faith that things would work out eventually, even though in reality they, they may very well not. But um, people were very reluctant to let that go, to let that dream go. I think that's a really important uh, example that you, you picked out, Rachel. Um, Gloria was voicing this, this profound frustration that a lot of people have that they're, they're working hard and they're not getting ahead. And I think I, since the book was written, I've been watching something in the South called the Moral Monday Movement, mm -hmm. where people are going down to the courthouse and they're, they're, they're uh, protesting some of the policies that make it hard to be poor in North Carolina and some of the other states. I think there's also a Moral Monday Movement in, in Georgia now. Um, but the idea that people are feeling this frustration and they want to say, well, we need to have a more moral society that is just to the poor, and we need to change the rules, not just play within the same rules anymore. And that kind of sentiment that's, that's voiced, I think, is actually becoming more general in our culture now. So I think it's really interesting. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is very much focused on, um, on reforming policies to expand yes. access uh, yes. to the American dream, and that seems to be um, a point that Gloria was trying to get to that, you know, um, our understanding, Mark, as you said, of the American dream uh, <coughs> tends to disproportionately focus on the role of the individual and uh, not, um, and not the role of the state, not the role of public policy, not on the role of the legal system that creates um, sort of the pathways for them uh, to be able to pursue the American dream. And I think this is really playing very heavily into um, a, a very concerning narrative that I think we've, we're, we're all familiar with. This is, you know, Romney's 47% of Americans are dependent on the government, and this is Paul Ryan's um, comfortable hammock of the social safety net um, that sort of lulls people into complacency. Um, that's very much at odds with I think the experience that Gloria was expressing is I'm, I'm doing my part, I'm doing the best I can. Right, right. And, um, you know, that's, we talk about sort of the a fundamental American paradox. And the paradox is that in American documents, we generally focus on the word all, liberty and justice for all. But in reality, it's really liberty and justice for some. And that's because equality of opportunity is not open to everyone in an equal fashion. That if you think about education or you think about various areas, uh, all children are not getting an equal education. Some children are getting an outstanding education, others are getting a very substandard education. And so it's, it is the case where uh, on the one hand we say the American dream is open to all, but in reality it's not. And so from a policy perspective, we need to think about how can we open up the avenues of opportunity? How can we create a society in which everyone is allowed to l really live up to their potential. That's the American dream, is, as was mentioned in the beginning of the, of the, of the session here. Um, what kind of policies can we have that will lead people to really live out their full potential? Those are the kinds of questions we need to think about. And what are some of the barriers that are in the way, which is what the second part of our, of our session today will talk about. And what are some of those ideas? You enumerate a, a, a few policy options in the book. Well, I mean, I, th I think that our book is really this concept of the life course, that um, people live their lives from, you know, starting from really conception and then, you know, to the end, which we all know what that is. And uh, so kind of, you know, really investing in early childhood education, investing in healthcare, nutrition, maternal nutrition, those are the really important uh, investments. And those investments are made very unequally across our society. We, we have a, a graphic which shows the, the poverty level among children of different, children of color versus white children. Very different kind of mosaic if you look at the country. That there are many, where I live in upstate New York where Cornell is, there's a large area where the African American children are living in poverty, the white children are not. So kind of different worlds in my, kind of in my region. So this kind of thing is still, it's the legacy of our, of our country that we still haven't dealt with yet. So I think we have really a lot of work to do. And then, of course, you know, job programs, educational access, all the things that happen in, in, early, in later childhood, adulthood, and then into uh, the working years. I think looking at, looking at um, the life course, and especially looking at the early years, that's really where the policy should be focused. 
And I think the other thing that we, that we talk about and, the, and that we'll get some, some insight into in a few minutes is the whole idea that if you look over the last 40, 40 years in America, the kinds of jobs that we've been creating are less and less high quality jobs. There, are, there is a small segment of, of very high quality jobs, but many of the jobs we're producing are low wage jobs without benefits that really prohibit people from living the American dream. The idea that if you work hard and you work at a job, you should be able to have a decent life. Well, that's becoming more and more difficult. So what are some policies that we could think about? And these, this is very difficult, but what are some policies to in improve the quality of jobs that we have in the United States? Great. Are there any closing thoughts that you would like to leave uh, the audience with before we transition to our conversation on, on some of those barriers and policy ideas? It's a great book, and you should pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to love it. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, that would be my, my closing thought. Um, well, thanks for showing up. Uh, uh, you know, it's great. It's really good to, t the idea of the book is to really begin a conversation about what can we do about the situation we're in. I think that's really what we want. Great. Th thank you both very thank much. You. And I second the endorsement. It is a wonderful <laughs> book. I thank encourage you. you to pick it up on the way out. And at this point, we're going to transition to the second half, and I'll invite our panelists to come up. So in the second half of our conversation, uh, we're going to look a little bit more deeply at some of the areas that Alita alluded to in her opening remarks um, at, that are currently serving as pervasive barriers to achieving the American dream, um, a weak labor market, uh, a criminal record, and digital discrimination. And we have an expert panel to tackle these issues. I'm very pleased to introduce Harry Holter. Uh, who is a professor of public policy at Georgetown University. Um, Harry was also the former, former chief economist at the U.S. Department of Labor and the Clinton administration. Um, Nicole Austin Hillary is the director uh, and counsel of the U.S. office, or excuse me, the D.C. office of NYU School, um, NYU School of Law's Brennan Center for Justice, and uh, Nicole is a leading voice on criminal justice reform. And finally, New America's own um, Sita Gandagaran, and she is a senior research fellow with the field team here at New America. Um, Sita is really one of our leading minds thinking about the intersection between uh, social justice and technology. Thank you all for being here. And we'll start, start with Harry. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Um, uh, I want to congratulate uh, Mark and Tom on a very fine book, a uh, book with lots of insights uh, and, and, and uh, a nice way of drawing all these insights together. Um, since I think I'm the only economist on the panel, possibly in the room, uh, I thought I should play the role of economist and talk a little about some of the complexities that, that I think have led to one of the phenomena that Mark and Tom emphasized, this changing job market and why it's so hard for people, especially for people, less educated folks, to get good jobs. Uh, and of course, Having more education is no guarantee either, uh, in, especially since the Great Recession started, but, but what that looks like and what it means for policies. So uh, let me sort of just throw out a few of these ideas. Um, the changes in labor markets leading towards more inequality in jobs and job quality have been very dramatic over the last 35 years. Uh, economists mostly talk about two sets of forces. Uh, market forces uh, and institutional policy forces. So the market forces are basically the growth of, of digital technologies uh, as well as several different kinds of globalization. The institutional forces are weakening unions, declining minimum wages, declining regulation. I think both of those sets of forces have played some role. As an economist, I actually lean a little more towards the market forces. Uh, and I, I think it's harder and harder for institutions within that market setting to play the role that they once played. Um, I, I think what these market forces mostly do, uh, some people call it skill-biased technical change, they replace people with high wages that, that are easily replaceable, that do a sort of routine kind of work uh, on assembly lines and offices, et cetera. And I think the big result uh, of these market forces, not that all good paying jobs have disappeared from America, far from it. Uh, what it's really done is it's reduced or even eliminated good paying jobs for people with only a high school diploma uh, or even less than a high school. Those have largely uh, disappeared. We create a lot of low paying jobs in America, a lot of low wage retail, uh, low end of the service sector jobs, uh, but many fewer 
good paying jobs for, for high school graduates uh, as we used to. And since 2007, since the Great Recession began, that's just one over overlay that makes it that much harder. Uh, everything is worse in terms of job availability for everybody. Uh, there's no guarantees. You can get a college diploma, you can get a graduate degree, and there's still no guarantees. And I think young people especially have been hit very hard uh, by this downturn. Uh, the recovery has also been very, very slow. I think it's, it's hard to recover from these kinds of downturns. Uh, when, when a financial bubble bursts, it leaves a big mess, uh, and, and it makes the recovery much slower. Um, but on average, uh, I think it has hurt, again, the people without those uh, skills. And I think this has two important implications. A lot of that is n nothing new. I mean, you've probably all heard that story. But there's two implications that I think need to be emphasized that make the situation that much more difficult. Number one, if you ever had an econ class, and people talk about something called the elasticity of demand, and you know, if that concept made you sick 30 years ago, I won't, but it say, basically means that if you try to push wages up, through some mechanism like unions or minimum wages, it's that much harder to do without job loss. Because employers have other places to go and consumers have other places to go. You know, when I was a kid 30, 40 years ago, the UAW could raise wages, the uh, auto companies would just simply pass it on to higher prices, and Americans would keep buying the cars. And that's one of the things that enabled unions to be powerful in that kind of their heyday from the 30s to the 50s or 60s. That's not true anymore. Americans can sit at a computer terminal and buy stuff from all over the world, including very low-wage labor markets. And that, that simply makes it harder, then, to sort of raise wages and pass on those, uh, those higher costs and higher prices. Um, and it, it means we're not going to regulate our way out of this. And, and by the way, employers. You know, employers simply have many more choices uh, in terms of technology and globalization. Not all employers. I mean, a lot of employers in the service sector, you can't replace people who clean your hotel rooms, for instance, with technology, you can't outsource those jobs. But those labor markets are flooded with all the people from other markets whose jobs have been eliminated. And again, it's just much harder for the markets to do all that. By the way, I support higher minimum wages. And I've signed statements in support of higher minimum economist statements. I have no trouble with a federal minimum wage going up to 9 to $10 an hour. I'm pretty worried about Seattle going up to 15 uh, we'll see. It's a great natural experiment. I'm actually even a little nervous about the District of Columbia and a couple of counties in Maryland going up to 1150 when, when Fairfax and Arlington are going to stay at seven and a quarter. And I just think over time it's going to be very easy for employers to start shifting more jobs in that direction. And I, I think that's not a right-wing fantasy. That's something we really have to wrestle with and, and think about. But the other phenomenon I think is very important. We're going to have a lot of low-wage jobs in America no matter what we do tens of millions of low-wage jobs. One of the ways in which people can still get to the, to the American dream in that context is to have two earner families. You know, uh, the ability of, of less educated folks to get to the American dream on, on one salary is just going to be very hard. Two earner families are important. And the problem with that is labor market changes have hit less educated men very hard. That's the group that's probably suffered the most. Uh, it's not just African-American men. It's also white and Latino men. And they are not viewed as very good marriage prospects when their earnings capacities are, are, are down. That's just a fact. If you plot the decline in marriage in America against the decline in wages for less educated men, it's almost a perfect fit. So the economic changes in some ways make it harder for a lot of these men and women to marry. And, and again, it was, a, it was an African-American story. But now you see it in the white working class. You see it in the Hispanic working class now. And, and, and that's troubling as well. Uh, because I think marriage and tuner families is one of the ways in which people with, with less schooling can still do this. So what does all this mean for policy? Uh, um, so first of all, obviously, you know, this is not a dramatic insight. Raising the skills of American workers helps. It doesn't guarantee. It's not a, a panacea, but on average it helps a lot. Uh, it's very troubling in America that not only are there very unequal chances for achieving good education based on race and class, the gaps seem to be growing wider. Uh, the, all the evidence now suggests that the gaps in achievement, college attainment, are growing wider uh, in the last 40 years. Those gaps, it, the fact that they exist at all runs counter to the notion of equal opportunity. The fact they're growing wider is, is very troubling. Um, I agree with what, what we've already heard from Mark and Tom about how to do that in investments in high quality early education and high quality K through 12 education. But I want to emphasize it's not just investments. Just spending dollars doesn't do the job. You got to make sure the dollars are well spent. It also means accountability uh, and incentives. Uh, and, and, and it's not one or the other. And people on the left and the right who argue it's one or the other, it's foolish. 
takes the right combination of incentives uh, and accountability and investments, I think, to make this happen. Uh, I look a lot at the higher end, sort of beyond high school, what do you need for the labor market? So for instance, in America, we send a lot of people to college. We give a lot of people Pell Grants. But you know, the Pell Grant is just a voucher that says, here, go to college, good luck when you get there. So we send a lot of people to college. We have these enormous college dropout rates in both four-year and two, and especially at the schools, the sort of the, the two-year colleges. Um, I think we could do more to reduce those, to help pe people who go to college who want to get a job, you know, use their college degree to get a job that pays well. Uh, there's a whole set of policies to make higher ed more responsive to the labor market and make it easier to get those uh, th those degrees. And by the way, I, I define college, I define post-secondary very broadly. It could be a good apprenticeship program. Uh, it could be other kinds of high quality career and technical ed and work-based learning. I'm not in favor of old-fashioned voc ed that tracks people by race and class. I'm talking about high quality career and technical ed that prepares people for good jobs uh, in high school and, and beyond high school as well in the post-secondary world. Sectoral efforts, career pathways, et cetera. But secondly, you know, we're in a world where a lot of jobs simply aren't going to pay well, period. So besides marriage and, and two earners, one of the things, um, we need government supports, public supports to supplement what are often low wages and benefits in the private sector. Uh, that means health care, uh, a la the, American, uh, the Affordable Care Act. That means child care. It means things like the Earned Income Tax Credit, which has done a lot of good for low-income moms with kids. I'd like to see it expanded to low-income men who are maybe non-custodial dads, uh, et cetera. But there's two problems with expanding those supports. Uh, there's a, a very powerful low-tax movement in America, uh, and there's a very powerful movement to defend government expenditures on, on retirees, uh, uh, expenditures on, on not only on Social Security, but on, on Medicare, which is, and, and the combination of those two things, low, the low-tax movement freezing the size of the federal sector and an ever-expanding uh, pot of money that goes only to retirement it means there's just nothing left. There's very little money left for making the kinds of investments and supplements uh, that we've been talking about. And I fault politicians, both on the left and the right, for not being honest with the American people about that. When was the last, you know, the last politician that I remember that talked about raising taxes was Walter Mondale. Didn't go so well for him, as I recall, <laughs> right? Every other Democrat's been running away from that issue. But it's, you, you need to get rid of the low tax. And, and you know, as I look at the numbers, you, know, it's, you don't have to be a genius to look at these numbers. You can have two out of three things. You can either have really low taxes, really generous retirement and health programs, or some extra money to spend on these things. You can have two of those, or you can't have all three of them simultaneously. It simply doesn't add up. Uh, and, and I think we're going to have to make some hard choices. Uh, 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 and, and if you look at Medicare, if you project out Medicare under almost any assumption, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are really going to eat up much less Medicaid than Medicare and Social Security. So I think we have to face hard choices there if we want there to be money to make these sensible investments. Finally, incarceration and issues like that are huge. Uh, and I know other panelists are going to talk about that. Um, the fraction, you know, low-income black men more than anyone else. If you're a black male high school dropout, the odds of being incarcerated are about two out of three. If you're any black man, the odds of being incarcerated have been one out of three. It's stunning. Uh, we simply need to lock up fewer people in America and those who have been locked up to help them get a foothold again. And we put so many barriers in place, it's absurd. But there's a positive note here. Uh, and there is increasingly a growing number of conservatives in this country, including conservative Republicans, who are also getting very tired of this. I think it's an enormous waste of money to lock up so many people and then to keep them from, uh, uh, from being able to make it afterwards. Uh, enormous waste of money. Uh, the libertarian strand hates this, and and and, and I'm I'm going to I'm going to panels and roundtables on limiting incarceration at fairly conservative think tanks like the Heritage Foundation these days, and I think that's a quite positive movement. It simply doesn't make sense for America to lock up so many people and then to keep them from bouncing back afterwards. And and child support, you know, if you worry about low income, child support is another big problem. Uh, these low income men. Get, get a child support order, the clock is ticking even when they're in prison, they come out, they're hugely in arrears, there's an enormous tax on their earnings, and they have all the incentives after that to not join the regular workforce, to go underground. Uh, and and I, I think we need to rethink some of those policies too. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, I think those are some of the complexities in the job market. And uh, again, congratulations on a, on, a, on a very, very good book, and, and hope we can have some good conversation afterwards. But thank you. Well, Harry, that was perfect because you actually segued very well into some of the things that I want to talk about. Um, 
you know, we actually have an underclass in this country. People who are part of our criminal justice system in the United States are really second class citizens. Not only do they become second class citizens when we incarcerate them, they remain second class citizens for life. That is an enormous problem in the United States that we simply have to fix. All of the things that you heard Mark and Tom talk about are palpable real issues. Imagine if you have the additional problem of being a person who has a criminal record. You are in a worse position than even the person who has not been able to attain a college degree or a graduate degree or the person who is in a low income job. You can't even compete with those individuals. You know, this is an interesting year for us. This is uh, the year 2014 is a year of many significant anniversaries. Um, one we know of is President Johnson's War on Poverty. Well, if you go back to the start of that War on Poverty and you look at what our criminal justice numbers looked like in terms of the numbers of Americans that we incarcerated and you compare that to the numbers that we incarcerate now, your head would explode. We have indeed become a nation that has a systemic problem of mass incarceration. I was at dinner last night with a group of, of friends, uh, professional friends. We all work in the areas of criminal justice. And when we started dinner, one of our friends had the question, Do, can any of you recommend a good criminal defense attorney for a friend whose 11-year-old son has just been suspended from school for a minor infraction. He had a small melee with another kid in his class. Now, I remember having small melees in school. I remember seeing small melees. You were sent to the principal's office. You might have gotten tapped on the wrist. Yes, back in the 70s, they could still tap you on the wrist. <laughs> um, and you, they called your parents, and everybody apologized, and you went home. Now, that same kind of incident may mean that not only are you sent to the principal's office and your parents are called, it may also mean that law enforcement is called in and that you as an 11 year old become part of our nation's criminal justice system. It's called the school to prison pipeline and it's real, it's palpable and it means that many young people, particularly young African American men, are becoming a part of our criminal justice system at a very early age and it starts a vicious cycle. So what does that mean for us as a country? We are now incarcerating 2.2 million people in this country, more than any other democratic society in the world. And even if you are not an incarcerated person, we still have a significant number of Americans who are a part of the criminal justice system through probation, through parole, through some kind of home confinement, and for all of these people, they have to deal with what that means for them in terms of housing, in terms of educational opportunities, in terms of employment opportunities, and in terms of their ability to simply participate in our democratic society. NPR just this past week, and I hope many of you heard it, and if you haven't, I urge you to go and listen to it, did a wonderful series on the criminal justice system and how fees and fines are impacting individuals who are part of the criminal justice system. I'm proud to say that the Brennan Center was a part of, of that series and a lot of the work that they referenced dealt with a report that we did at the Brennan Center called Fees and Fines. What they talked about is if you become a member of the criminal justice system, even the ways in which you get out of that system are costly to you in terms of real dollars and cents. Many of you probably don't know, but in some jurisdictions, we all know about Gideon and the right to counsel. And I think for many Americans, they, their understanding of that is what they saw in Law and Order. And they think, you get in trouble, and the local government appoints a counsel to you, and you get help, and that's it. Well, in some jurisdictions, you actually have to pay for that. You no longer, everywhere in America, and, and get simply a counsel when you get in trouble. Also, you have other fees and fines related to your incarceration. There are some jurisdictions where they actually charge you for your period of incarceration, where you are paying for the bed and the food. Once you get out, you get a bill. 
There are also some jurisdictions where once you get out of jail, if you have any kind of past debts that you owe to the government, whether it be for parking tickets, whether it be for overdue child support payments, you will remain a part of the criminal justice system until those fees are paid. And what does that mean for us? That means that you are then caught in a cycle that is very hard for you to get out of. Once you are finished with your incarceration period, what's the first thing everyone has to do? You know you have to get a job. If you can't get a job because you are someone with a criminal justice back, with a criminal history, then how in the world can you pay the fees and fines that have now been attached to you so that you then can become a taxpayer, a, a good citizen of the United States? That becomes very difficult to do. So we have all of these barriers in place at every one of these junctures of what I call the four important and crucial areas of life that we all depend on, your housing. Imagine if you are someone who has come out of the prison system. Where do you go to live? Most people don't necessarily have a home of their own to return to. They may return to live with relatives. Well, for many people who are in our criminal justice system, they are people who come from poor economic backgrounds. And they may have relatives who live in public housing. And therefore, your option is to return to live with that family member who is in public housing. But guess what? In the United States, if you have a criminal background, you are banned from public housing. And that doesn't simply mean that you yourself can't get access to public housing. That may mean that the auntie, the uncle, the grandmother, who is the tenant in that public housing unit, who has said, come live with me, they very well have been told, if you allow this person with a criminal history to come and live with you, you will, you will be in violation of your lease. And not only will they not have a place to live, you will be evicted from your public housing unit. So then you have no place to live. And we talk about educational opportunities and how important they are. Well, it, there was a time when, in our criminal justice system, our jails actually provided opportunities for individuals to get training, to get education. This was an important part of the restoration process. And remember, in this country, we say, we talk a good talk about this, we say that when we send people to jail, it is not supposed to be about merely punishing individuals. It's supposed to be about providing opportunities for individuals to remake themselves and their lives so that they can return to society and become productive members of our communities. Well, we now no longer provide those same educational opportunities in prison. We now no longer provide the same level of treatment services. So that if you have health issues, if you have mental health issues, if you have trainings that you would like to get, you no longer have those same opportunities. Those are few and far between. So then you leave the criminal justice system, or at least you leave incarceration, and you try to find a job, and you don't necessarily have the skills that are required to get the kinds of jobs that will enable you to actually support a family. And let's say that you do. Uh, I have a friend in the criminal justice system who actually is an attorney. Uh, and he, uh, through a, a drunk driving incident, um, killed his girlfriend and had to be incarcerated for a certain period of time. And he came out of jail clearly with a high level of education. But we know we have this problem of employers asking you on job applications, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Have you ever served time in jail? Well, many employers will hold that against you. And regardless of what your skill set is, regardless of what kind of contributions you may be able to make to that employer, they don't want to talk to you. So there is an effort underway to do what we call ban the box. Take that box off of job applications and simply look at candidates based on their skill sets and their educational backgrounds. And until we do that, that means that that prison time, that criminal justice background, again, can be a severe barrier to you even getting a job. So now we see you can't get housing. You can't get the educational opportunities that you would like to so that you can become a, a productive member of our society. You cannot necessarily get the jobs that you need. And then in terms of becoming a member of our democratic society, you can't, in many instances, even vote. 
there are very few states, I think two, that allow you to vote even when you are still incarcerated. Most jurisdictions take that right away from you. And it's funny, when I often talk to, to, to everyday average Americans about this issue, many of them think, well, we understand that, that that right is taken away from you while you're incarcerated, but certainly it's restored when you come out of jail. It is not. In most instances, your right to vote is not restored. And in many instances, in states with very draconian laws, like Virginia, Kentucky, you have to petition the governor of your state for special permission to be considered to have your rights restored. So not only are we keeping you from housing, employment, and educational opportunities, we're also keeping you from voicing your opinion in this country through the ballot box. And we know that is the main way in which we all as citizens are playing on an equal, on an equal playing field. Everyone has that same opportunity to express themselves through the ballot box. If you don't have that opportunity, you then don't have the same voice, the same opportunities to express yourself as do other Americans. So what we have in place is a system that basically says, if you make a mistake, if you commit a crime, we are going to do everything we can to keep you from really returning to society and becoming a productive member of your community. That is not what this country is supposed to be about. The Declaration of Independence says we're all created equal. And we all believe that in this country. And we all believe that even when you make a mistake, you are supposed to be given an opportunity to correct that mistake and do better the second time around. Well, we have turned into a society where we really are not providing those second chances, those additional opportunities. So this is a huge problem. And it is an area where we have got to insist that our legislators, our policy reformers, put their thinking caps on and figure out how do we provide opportunities for these individuals. And let me be clear about this. Oftentimes when organizations like the Brennan Center talk about uh, restoring voting rights and providing these opportunities, sometimes people get confused. And they think what we're saying is we don't think people should pay for crimes that they've committed. No. I think we all agree if someone does something bad, if someone does something that breaks a law, we think you should indeed pay your debt to society. What we don't believe is that that should be a permanent state of existence for you. We do not believe that, therefore, you should be kept from being a productive member of your community. That does not make sense in terms of uplifting our country. It does not make sense in terms of productivity. And it certainly doesn't make sense from the perspective of making our communities safe. If you are not giving individuals an opportunity to reinvest in their communities, to become solid family members, to become the heads of households, you are leaving them in a set of circumstances in which perhaps the only choices they have are to return to the criminal justice system. That is an insane system. That is not what we should be encouraging. We should be putting ourselves in a position where we make it possible for people to actually stay out of the criminal justice system. So here's the good news. I know that all sounds dire, but here is some of the good news. There are actually reformers and policymakers who are thinking about what we need to do to make these changes. Harry already mentioned some of them. We do have people on both the left and the right who are talking about how we solve these problems. State legislators are looking at the fact that the ways in which we incarcerate people and keep them in the criminal justice system are simply costing too much money for our states. And it's taking money away from education, housing, other areas where we simply know we need to invest. As a result, they're looking at alternatives to incarceration. Uh, there is a, a group of reformers called Right on Crime. It is made up of uh, conservative individuals who, uh, are, who are working very closely with the progressive community and are saying, we've got to have a meeting of the minds on these issues, and we've got to figure out ways that we can work together to provide these opportunities and to stop this groundswell of mass incarceration in the United States. In Congress, there are members who are saying, we've got to make some changes. Senator Ben Cardin and Congressman John Conyers in the House have introduced a bill called the Democracy Restoration Act. This bill would restore the right to vote to all individuals who have been formerly incarcerated once they have finished their incarcerated period. 
And it, it is regardless of whether you owe fees and fines. It is regardless of whether you remain on probation or parole. Again, because they understand that you have to have a voice in your communities. And they also understand that this sets an example for your families. We have had instances at the Brennan Center where we've talked to, in town hall settings, we've talked to people in communities who have said, once I had my right to vote restored, not only did it make me feel like I became a part of, this, of the community, my children saw that example. They saw me going to the ballot box, exercising this right, standing up and saying, it is important to be a part of our democracy. And that has a trickle down effect. So not only do those kinds of policy reforms impact the individual, it impacts their families. When your children see that you are able to earn a living wage and take care of them, that impacts them, that impacts the goals that they set for themselves and what they think is possible for themselves. When they see that you are able to put a roof over their heads, they know that they can depend on you, that that provides stability. That stability means that those young people then have opportunities that they can take advantage of because they're not worrying about things like, will we have a place to live? Will my father or mother be able to feed me, to clothe me? They see when you have a job and you go to work every day that, again, that is opportunity, opportunity that they can take advantage of, and it provides a model for future achievement for them. So we have lawmakers that are looking at that. We have lawmakers that are looking at things like banning the box. The EEOC actually instituted um, a, a, a note, they had a note and comment period where they asked for um, policymakers and advocates to talk about this issue of banning the box. And they have since come out uh, with a recommendation that employers stop asking about criminal just criminal history backgrounds. Um, and there are other policymakers who are looking at that. And they are saying that unless your criminal history background has a direct impact on the job that you are seeking, there's no reason to ask for it. You should simply be looking at what the qualifications are for an individual. So I say all this to say that even though we have individuals who have difficult times accessing the job market, accessing educational opportunities. We have got to go beyond that and look at this underclass of individuals and think about how do we make changes in this country? How do we stop this issue of mass incarceration? And what do we do to ensure that the individuals who are a part of the criminal justice system can reintegrate in, in, in our communities? When I talk to Americans about how do we fight crime and how do we keep our communities safe, that is a key way to keep our communities safe. If everyone feels invested in their communities, they then feel invested in keeping them safe and being productive members and working hand in hand with their neighbors, with their schools, with their law enforcement officials. That is the way that we have to keep our communities safe. And that is all related to ensuring that we are providing more opportunities for all Americans. So I will stop there. And I look forward to having a, a, a thoughtful conversation uh, about these issues. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And also, um, I want to be, I'm excited to have a conversation between us and also with the audience. Um, I'm going to try and pivot by talking about what I think all of us have been addressing. Um, which is this concept of cumulative, I think in your book you refer to cumulative inequality, or um, as I've been talking about it in some of my work, uh, cumulative disadvantage. And I want to do that by talking through this question of technology and our increasing reliance as a society on data-driven systems, big data, predictive analytics, um, and how that lines up with some of the issues that we've been talking about. So um, I think in my introduction, Rachel mentioned that I work at the intersection of social justice and technology. Um, these issues about the criminal justice system, um, about workforce development, about education, um, these are issues that directly intersect with some of the questions that I think are coming up um, in tech policy circles. Um, that have not been adequately addressed. Um, so I just want to um, step back and, and talk a little bit about technology and about big data and what it is and how it intersects with some of these ideas. So, um, you know, we're, we're operating in an environment now where we increasingly reveal information about ourselves that is, um, you know, both 
aggregate and anonymized information about ourselves, that's identifiable information by our, about ourselves. Um, that information is fed into data brokers. So let me just give you an example of um, the kinds of information that we reveal about ourselves that relates to um, information um, about our voting records, about our credit card use, about um, um, you know, uh, our social media use, which I think uh, is increasingly being used in uh, law enforcement and things of that nature. Um, we create digital footprints about ourselves that are difficult to put a container on, difficult to identify boundaries, and there are actors that are increasingly using that information to either turn a buck, to target us, um, to sometimes penalize us, and that, I think, is a worrisome trend. So Nicole um, talked about uh, banning the box. Um, imagine a scenario where that information is already out there in the, on the internet, and it's, in, it's difficult to put that information away. So we might ban that information on an application, but because of the way our society works, um, we might have a scenario where people are, and this is, a, so let me, come back to a study, let me identify a study that um, was done by Latanya Sweening at uh, Harvard University that looked at the disparity between um, advertisements that appear when you search for Caucasian sounding names versus black sounding names. And one of the things that she found was that with black sounding names, you saw advertisements for um, criminal background checks, right, which is suggesting that when people are actually searching for um, African American sounding names, that they are doing it within the context of um, looking at your background, trying to determine is this person a criminal or not. Um, now, it's it's difficult to to get around that system, right? That reflects a, uh, you know biases that we have as a society, um, but that information is out there, and that can I think be very detrimental, um, not just in terms of you know, applying for a job, but just at if, if you don't have a background, a criminal record, um, imagine what that, that experience has on you as an individual as you're um, learning how to use the internet for, for, for the first time, and you search your name, and one of the first things that comes up is, you know, do you have a background? Um, that is really something that shows to you how you are valued in this world. And I think there's a cultural impact that that experience can have. Um, I think with predictive analytics, um, there are four or five um, practices that disproportionately disadvantage um, communities of color. So the one that I've just described is um, that these predictive systems, these systems that make inferences about ourselves um, are biased. They reflect bias in society. Um, there's also the possibility that these automatable systems actually reflect um, uh, you know, biased decisions, that they come from bad actors. Um, these systems also reflect um, any inaccuracies that disproportionately affect um, communities of color. So I'll give the example of the E-Verify database, which is a database that's run by the Department of Homeland Security and the Social Security Administration. Um, this is a system that's designed to uh, verify your eligibility as an employee, right, that um, tracks between W-9 forms. And um, the problem with these systems is that often employers are inputting names incorrectly. And for um, people of color that have non-Caucasian names, there's a high degree of error. So there's a chance that somebody, an employer has inputted your name into the database and then they try to check that against your existing W-9 form and there's a mismatch. And what's the um, outcome of that? Well, it means you don't get a job because you're not seen as um, having a legitimate reason to work uh, in this country. Um, so there's bias in these systems because of inaccuracies. Um, there's also the problem of, um, of increasingly 
uh, these technological, these automatable systems are relying on proxy variables or proxy indicators that make, that kind of s circumvent or are different or uh, escape the, the usual types of um, regulations that have come about through the civil rights movement. So, um, you know, with credit, for example, there are now a number of variables that you can use to determine someone's credit worthiness that aren't protected under our various um, credit laws. And the effect of that is, I think, there's increasingly gray area and room for these kinds of um, services to actually um, target people and channel them into uh, uh, you know, uh, either products that they don't need, pro predatory products that they don't need, um, and it's increasingly difficult to track. Um, and the last um, area that I, I think I'd like to focus on and that I've written about has to do um, with, um, with the use of data that's out there that is correct but has the result of really, I think, um, disadvantaging and pe keeping people in this, um, in this uh, you know, path of uh, no opportunity. And so the example that I want to turn to is the case of um, reverse redlining. Um, so in the 2000s, um, as subprime products became available, there was um, a real increase in the lending industry, in the subprime industry, um, in terms of using different data points to target certain kinds of consumers for subprime products. That information was collected from offline data as well as online data. So what you were searching for online, whether you are, were on bankrate.com looking for a mortgage, that information was collated with, um, you know, your IP address and, uh, you know, geographical information, which then meant that you were marketed these um, high-risk products. Um, now we know from we know today that African Americans and Latinos were targeted at higher rates than um, other other um, populations, and we also know today that. Um, that African Americans and Latinos remain the most disadvantaged or the, um, they are not recovering from the economic recession um, at the same rate as other populations. And what I wonder about when I hear stories like this is to what extent are the data that we're releasing about ourselves and that's being collected by a number of actors um, really creating this cycle where what we see, what we consume, um, what we think are opportunities are actually very narrow slices of what's possible. And um, I think that it's worrisome um, that we increasingly have uh, less and less control over how, <coughs> excuse me, how this information is used about us. Um, I would say, because I do want to move into the conversation, I would say that there is some, some hope. So Mark and Tom, you mentioned Moral Mondays and the fact that there is some, I think, activity within, uh, on, at the grassroots um, with uh, you know, people realizing that actually we have a voice and we have something to say about what might be wrong in these systems. I think similarly within the tech policy space and within the conversation around predictive analytics and how that might be kind of coordinating us off in a particular path in society, um, we're seeing a number of civil rights and social justice groups really pay attention to these issues and thinking, think about how technology is changing the way that law enforcement is um, done in this country um, and or how we're um, available, to, uh, how we're able to um, access economic opportunity. Um, recently, the Open Technology Institute here at the New America Foundation was a signatory on a set of civil rights principles, civil rights principles for the era of big data. And I think that's um, some sign that some of these conversations are bubbling up from the ground that actually we need to think about how inequality and injustice 
are manifesting themselves in increasingly invisible and sof technically sophisticated ways. And we need to um, empower our, um, you know, not just individuals, but our social support system to help root out these problems and help um, prevent them from happening. Um, I would say there's a, there is a host of other, um, I think, policy interventions that we could pay attention to in the um, data broker industry and so forth. Um, I won't go into those because I, I don't think we have time for those. Um, I will just mention very quickly, um, because Nicole had talked about education and correctional education, um, one of the things that I'm very interested in is um, literacy, whether that's digital literacy, um, privacy and data literacy, but in general, I think we need um, a greater, um, we need to incorporate technology and how technology might be creating bias <laughs> in systems and, you know, uh, exposing us to limited kinds of opportunity. Um, you know, whether that's in the correctional education system or in early education, I think we need to understand how um, technology is playing a role in discrimination. So I'll end there and uh, we'll open it up to conversation. Great, thank you all so much for making those thoughtful comments and if everybody would just join me in giving them a round of applause before we transition to our conversation. Uh, well, first, uh, Mark and Tom, this has been a lot of food for thought. Um, I'd like to invite you to give any reflections that you've had on the comments from uh, your fellow panelists. Well, I, I think that each each is is pointing out barriers to um, the American dream. So I think that uh, the points are are very well taken. And um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is a really great panel. I think one of the underlying questions that was across all three of the responders is, and I think it's also implicit in our book, our book kind of begins around 1968, 1970, and then looks at what's happened in society since that period. And that really is the period of a technological revolution where you have Moore's Law that, you know, uh, computing power, microprocessors are, are doubling in power every 18 months. It's a really profound thing. So, so information technology is getting cheaper, more powerful, more easily used to replace low-skill workers, even to replace high-skill workers, to do the kind of uh, digital discrimination that Evita was talking about, that Nicole is talking about, the criminal justice. So I think really what it means to live in a high-tech society, I think, is a really profound question that we really haven't dealt with at all. I think, I mean, we've dealt with it to some extent, but I think it's really a critical element. Just to say, so at the Open Technology Institute, we've done a lot of work in digital literacy and digital inclusion, and um, we worked in the city of Philadelphia as they um, were trying to roll out this project um, to bring people online, and it was out of the Recovery Act, and it was um, really amazing to see how much hope <laughs> there was around learning to use technology and using, um, and having technology be part of that American dream, right? Um, right. And, and some of the fears, right, that we're going to be automated out, uh, you know, that we're not prepared for our digital future um, as workers, but also that, you know, there might be some concern that we don't have a control over our digital footprint. Um, and that, you know, we could actually do good by becoming more and more digitally literate. Yeah, I think when we have more powerful technology, we almost need more powerful morality to yeah. go with that more because this, this stuff can really do things and it can go in the wrong direction or it can go in you know, a really good direction. And learning about, people learning about the technology, that's also a really important verb, learning about it, how, deploying it, how to use it for, for civic purposes, not just for private gain or for whatever, behind the scenes discrimination also giving people access to it. You know, one of the th big issues that the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights works on is how do we ensure that the poor and working class even have access to the technology? Uh, and we know we often talk about things that we want to change to make things easier for Americans, like for instance, with respect to voting. There's a lot of discussion about online voter registration. Well, many of the poor and working class do not have access to computers. They don't have laptops in their homes. Um, 
and, and lots of people say, oh, but they can go to the libraries. You know, we know that states are closing libraries, that there, there simply is not that access. So I think that's got to be part of the conversation, too. How do we even bring some of the underclass into the realm of having access to the technology that's going to help make their lives better? Yeah, in North Philadelphia, there's very little internet access in the poor area of Philadelphia. So I think that's really, really, how can you get a job if you can't go on the internet? It's, very, it's much more difficult. So let me make one point, and I've agreed with virtually almost everything I've heard by everyone else on the panel. But again, sometimes these things are a little more nuanced th than we thought. Um, I have done studies based on surveys of employers that ask employers, do you check criminal backgrounds on the internet, which has become very cheap and easy to do, uh, and, th and then what kinds of people do you hire? Surprisingly, we found in a, in a whole series of studies that employers who check criminal backgrounds actually hire more black men than they otherwise would. And, and it's, it's a counterintuitive phenomenon because a lot of the reason employers, I mean, and we all know this, there's discrimination based simply on race and gender. There's discrimination based on criminal background and sometimes there's the combination of the two. But it looked like if employers can do a criminal background check and find out that a black man doesn't have a criminal background, they're much more comfortable hiring them. It was kind sort of a surprising. So, so it's not as though the internet and criminal background checks are all bad. I think the problem is that often the information is misused. Uh, and I think if people followed the EO guidelines about the right way and the wrong way to use this information, it wouldn't be a problem. The problem is that a lot of employers don't follow the EO guidelines. We can't enforce that. And, and, then I, I, and I, think, I think there's a, a subtle difference. I think the problem with, with, the, problem with the box on the application is that employers see the box checked and then they throw it out without looking more carefully at other information. Uh, and, and so I, I have a little bit of sympathy, some sympathy for ban the box. At the same time, I think that the information that employers can get is not all bad if it's used judiciously. And so I support EEO efforts to make sure the information, but not efforts to completely block the information. And, but I also, you know, the, the ban the box thing is that I think an effort to not suppress the information, but to get employers, give this guy a look before you make that judgment. And I think in that guy's, but it, but it is a more sort of nuanced way, I think, of thinking about the issues. All right, well, let's go ahead and open the conversation up to the audience. There's a microphone. If you have a question for anybody or everybody on the panel, please just raise your hand, um, state your affiliation, and please uh, phrase your question in the form of a question. Um, my name is Sahan, like I said, and I'm interning this summer in Washington, D.C. And I think Nicole probably could answer the, my question more than anyone else. So, I mean, you were certainly bringing up great points about how the United States incarcerates more people and even countries like even China and Iran. Uh, do you think that another reason for this mass incarceration is the private prison system where these many of these private companies are like, they're, 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 they're sole, their sole motive is profit, so of course, you know, when there's more more if it's a more likely area where there's like more crime to happen that means it's a more it's better for their bottom line so you think that the privatization of prisons is another very big reason for the mass incarceration and the misuse of the criminal justice system here in America a a absolutely and you know it's very difficult to uh, separate uh, economics from any of these issues <laughs> as you know um, and the the private prison industrial complex we know is massive. Um, and it has grown tremendously over the last 40 to 50 years. Um, so certainly, when there are incentives uh, in place uh, for businesses to make money by incarcerating people, by building more prisons, by producing more guards, more security systems, more security services, yes, that is certainly a part of the problem. I think, though, from a policy perspective, there's far less being done to address that. Um, and I don't think that's surprising. I think with respect to anything in this country where we are taking on large corporations and large industries, there's always tentativeness, even from policymakers, even from legislators. Um, and that also kind of gets into the whole money and politics issue and like who pays for campaigns and what helps keep people in office. But that's for another panel on another day. Um, but so yes, so the simple answer to your question is yes, I think that, that that is a huge part of it and something that we've got to address further. It's simply not being talked about enough. Of course, in some places, it's the only jobs available for low-income men and gotcha. women, which you know means not just the, it's not just the businesses, but the workers in those areas and their unions, uh, and and that doesn't make it right. Yeah, yeah. But but it, again, it, it complicates it a little bit. Great. Next question. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Oliver Grimm. I'm the um, US correspondent for a newspaper from Austria, which is called Die Presse. Um, 
I would be interested in, in your view whether the American political system is actually capable of addressing all the, the grievances that you've, you've pointed out in, in the criminal justice system and the, in the social system and so forth. Um, because I'm particularly struck if I look at most European countries over the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years, we've tried to enlarge um, suffrage. We've tried to make it easier for people to vote. The voting age in Austria is 16. In Estonia, you can vote online. Um, we make any effort, I think even in most countries, you can. I'm not pretty sure about that, but in most European countries, you can even vote if you're in prison, unless it's for a very you know, severe uh, thing. Uh, we've, if, you, if you're an EU citizen, you're allowed to vote in any other country in municipal elections. So I was living in Belgium, I'm Austrian, I voted in the municipal elections in Brussels. And I have the impression that on the other hand in the US, you're on, 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 on the state level particularly, you're putting up more and more barriers to voting. You've got this crazy gerrymandering. Actually, it's, you don't really have free elections anymore in many places in America. You, you have these crazy systems of introducing ID laws and so forth and so forth. So just to, to cut that long question short, is the American political system in a position to, to do anything about this? Because I don't really see any, any big difference between voting for a Democratic or a Republican president, you know. Th they, they, they will promise all sorts of different things, but we haven't really regulated the financial markets and so forth and so forth and so forth, you know. Thank you. Sorry, big question, but it, 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 it nags me, you know. <laughs> Does anybody want to take that on? <laughs> I have a lot to say about that, but I just yeah. answered the last one, so I'll let somebody else go first, and I'll, well, I'll I have just add on. I comment on that, which is uh, it's unusual that y we have uh, elections in this country on a Tuesday. Uh, most countries have elections on a holiday or on uh, a weekend where people are off, but we, we have our, our elections, which again makes it more difficult, particularly for some folks, to vote versus other folks. So, um, but I don't have an answer to your big question. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with everything you said until your last comment. It doesn't make a difference because they're all the same. They're not all the same. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, <laughs> it was, of course, and you, and you succeeded. It wasn't, it wasn't correct, however. Um, at, but you know, and I, I think to me the problem is that, you know, frankly, there is one political party that has a vested interest in suppressing the vote. Uh, and and they, so, so even people who in principle might certainly agree that you know, once people have served the debt to society or, or making it easier, uh, in practice, uh, it is in their interest. And, and, I th I think, and, and of course, the Supreme Court keeps making decisions that weaken the Voting Rights Act that throw out restrictions that, that, that all that, that just feed that problem and make it worse. So I, I agree with you, it's a very serious problem and there's sort of structural factors that just make it hard to reform. I'll just say really quickly um, to, you know, Mark and Tom said the last thing to go is hope. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that most, you know, from the vantage of where I stand, um, which is, you know, I do work in DC and I do a lot of work with social justice groups on the ground. Um, there is an incredible amount of optimism that things are going to get better. And I know that sounds crazy given your long question <laughs> and how you <laughs> set everything up. I mean, I agree that it's difficult, but um, there's resilience out there, and I think there is an expectation that we can do better. And actually, Americans as a whole uh, tend to be more optimistic than folks in other countries. Uh, we tend to rank, rank, rank higher in terms of, of levels of optimism. So, um, so yeah, I think that's right. Um, I, I have to quickly just go back to the history in this country. I think one of the differences, because one of the things we often talk about is, yes, if you compare us to European countries, they are much more advanced in terms of voter registration and the whole voting process and how their, uh, their citizenry is engaged. But you can't, the history of this country is one that is based on the subjugation of a class and race of people. And many of the voting laws, if you go back to their, uh, you know, to, to their development, were based on an effort to keep those individuals, those descendants of slaves, out of the political system. Um, and I know everyone in this room has probably read it, but I, I, we always go back to it, but Michelle Alexander's book, um, The New Jim Crow, gives a very interesting and poignant accounting of that history. Um, so I think to, to understand the story of why we have the, some of the voting laws that we have on the books in this country, why there are still efforts in place to suppress the vote, particularly of not just black and brown people, but of the poor, of the elderly, of students, um, that 
is all related to that history of making certain that certain classes of people um, and certain political parties get to maintain power while other groups don't get to uh, come to an, an equal level of power. Um, and I think as long as we have these interests, as long as we have parties and certain lawmakers who have a vested interest in keeping some people out of the political process, we are going to continue to face these problems. Um, I, though, am a glass half full person. I certainly think that we can chip away at it. Um, I think there are inroads that we can make. Um, but I certainly think that you know, as long as we have these, these individuals with these interests, we're going to continue to have these issues to fight against. Great. And since we're running short on time, and actually we are, in fact, over time, uh, I would like to take a couple final questions, rapid fire style. We'll package them, present them to the panel uh, as a whole. So if you have a question, Raise your hand now. Uh, probably to, I, I guess, Harry or, or to Nicole. I'm surprised that people don't talk about what does it cost to incarcerate a person in America? You, you know, forget all the morality. You know, on, on an ideal world, it should be nice for people to do this, or whatever. But sometimes you can talk to people about their pocketbooks because if you put all these two point, whatever the number of people is in jail, who's going to pay for that? We, we pay for that. And so to me, that might be part of the argument we should, we should begin to make. Okay, Elliot up front. Sure. Hi, Debbie Weinstein, Coalition on Human Needs. Um, you've all recounted, and we've heard even more examples of uh, uh, barriers that are starting earlier and earlier and earlier to deny opportunities uh, just reading about expulsions of three and four year olds from preschool and, and um, uh, credit checks as well as incarceration, uh, denying employment. At what point, um, if ever, will uh, kind of the powers that be start to think of this as being economically not in our interest to uh, sort of um, block such a substantial part of our population from making the full contribution they can make or would have been able to make to our economy. Great, and let's take one more. Yes, my name is Rolf Feuer, and I'm from the Swedish Embassy. I wonder if I could ask about a specific ethnic group. You uh, described, the office described ethnic groups as sort of one of the possible currents that could help you along or, or not help you along in, in life. And uh, my understanding, without being a, an expert at all, is that uh, if you look at uh, Americans of Asian descent, in some sense, they have done fairly well for themselves in the last 30, 40 years. They were having low incomes and so on, uh, if you look about 40 years back, while it's now they tend to have higher incomes so maybe than, than European descendants and, and also higher educational achievements. So I just wonder what, what has made the American dream possible that for that particular group of people. Sorry, you could have you a low speaking voice, and so we just could you just repeat the question? Oh, okay. That's okay. <laughs> yes, uh, I wondered a little bit what, what might or might not have set the Asian or the group of Asian oh. descendants apart. They seem to have been doing fairly well the last 40, 30, 40 years. They, they were a fairly poor group, of, as far as I understand, 40 years back, but now they have higher incomes than many uh, Caucasians and uh, they have higher educational achievements, etc. So what has made the American dream possible for that group uh, to a larger extent than other groups possibly? I, I'd like to take on the, the self-interest question. Um, I think that that's a really, uh, it's a really important argument to make and to say that we should invest in our people is really in all of our self-interest, that we will be a more productive workforce, we'll be more competitive, you know, it's that kind of, kind of argument. I know Harry has done work on what is the cost of poverty in general. And um, so maybe you could comment on, on that. No, I, I, I certainly agree with the sentiment that, that, that you expressed. Uh, uh, and, and it all goes, also goes back to your question just about the cost. We're, we're, we're spending so much on keeping people locked up. It's different ways of cutting the data. By some measures, it costs more to send somebody to prison than to Harvard or, or Georgetown, uh, uh, and that's problematic. I think the problem is that there's big debates about how, how effective these investments are. Uh, and you know, are, a lot of the everything from, from pre-K to expand, you know, Pell Grants, all those things, you know, a lot of the workforce development programs we know that, that the evidence of their cost effectiveness is usually mixed. The best programs clearly work. 
uh, a lot of the, so, so I think that just muddies the water and complicates the debate. And I, I, that debate's gotten so polarized, I want to have a debate about how can we make investments and then make sure that they are effective. And I think that's, that's a discussion that, that I think there can be wide agreement on, uh, on from both sides of the aisle. Uh, then the other question the gentleman asked about immigrants, uh, there is still a lot of upward mobility for people who are either very entrepreneurial or, or could do well in, in sort of a technical world and in a higher ed world. Uh, uh, the, the America works great for a lot of those people. It, it's for the folks who don't fit into those categories, I think, that, that your book yeah. correctly raises a lot of difficult issues. Yeah. And I'll just add one <clears throat> bit. Um, as the child of you know, the American dream, my parents, um, my mother is from the Philippines, my dad is from India. Um, the Asian population in the United States is very diverse. It's not a homogeneous community. There are you know, so many different kinds of Asians here. And not all Asians have the same opportunity, and they don't fit into those same categories. So I think it's something actually really important to think about when we're looking at, well, who's doing well and who's not doing well. I actually want to jump in and ask one final question about the cost of marginalization. I think everybody has made an argument that these um, individual experiences aggregate on a societal level, and some with an explicit cost, you know, $500 billion a year in the cost of child poverty, for instance. Um, but we are, as um, you two explain in the book, a highly individualized society where a lot of um, the attention is focused on uh, the ability of the individual to navigate whatever circumstances are before this person. So um, even though we can put a price tag and we can um, identify the consequences to all of us of injustices to some of us, is that, is that persuasive? Well, I, I think uh, it's, I mean, costs and benefits are seen from different points of view. And I think the, the gentleman from Austria was talking about, well, how can, how can the political system reform itself? Well, we have growing economic inequality. I think that leads to growing political inequality, where people, people um, want to protect their own interests. And I think that really is the process that we're in, where people are not, they're not getting what they want from the American dream from one side or the other. So they're, they're trying to achieve some kind of reform of the system. So what kind of programs do we have? How does economic inequality translate into political inequality? And, how does, and for politics, that's the way that people solve problems, is going into politics and then reforming the system. So I think those, these kinds of questions that we're asking, there are people in the criminal justice system who are benefiting from all the incarceration, right? The, the people that, are, that own the prisons, or to the extent you have private prisons. So I think really this, this process of growing economic inequality leads into political activity in the long run. So I think a, a strong argument is that what are the values that we really believe in and do we really live up to those values? I think that to me is a very strong argument and I think you could, from everything we've been saying on this panel, the issue is we are not living up to those values. And that to me is, is the key question. I actually think the values point is such an important one um, and, and if I had just one closing remark it would be you know, despite the numbers, despite the statistics and all of these things that we've talked about today, one of the things that we have to get at is how do we reach the, the moral hearts and minds of people in this country? Um, you know, when we talk about some of these criminal justice issues, we recognize that there are some people who simply don't care. They think it's not impacting me, this is not my kid, these are not my relatives, I don't have to think about it, these are the bad people, I don't care if they go away, I don't care if we put them to death, I don't care about any of that. We have to start having conversations in, in this country where in, we can engage everyone to feel invested in these issues and to understand how it is indeed impacting you and your neighbor and your child and your niece and nephew. I think that's got to be a foundational conversation um, and it's one that we, we simply haven't been having. I think that's a great place to stop. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists and thank you all for being so generous with your time.